Hello, today is Tuesday, June 23rd of 2020. My name is Carolina Montes. I am interviewing Jason Argetta for the, um, I'm sorry, for the Voices Oral History Project um, at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, please know, Mr. Argetta, that this interview will be placed at the Nettie Lee Benson Latin American Collection at UT Austin. Uh, if there is anything you do not wish to answer or discuss, I will honor your wishes. Also, if there is any, something you would like to discuss, please make sure to bring it up and we'll talk about it. Because we are not discussing this interview in person, I need to record your verbal consent. Um, Votes wishes to archive your interview along with any other photographs or other documentation at the Benson Library at UT Austin. We will retain copyright of the interview and any other materials you donate to Votes. So I need your response to these three questions. Please say, yes, I agree, or no, I do not agree after each. Do you give Votes consent to archive your interview and materials at the Benson Library? Yes, I agree. Do you grant Voices copyright over the interview and any material you provide? Yes, I agree. Do you agree to allow us to post this interview on the internet where it may be viewed by people around the world? Yes, I agree. Okay, great. So now we'll get started. If you could tell me a little bit about yourself, like when and where you were born. Uh, I've lived in Morristown my entire life, born and raised. Uh, cultural background, both of my parents are immigrants from Honduras. They came here in the 90s. So, yeah. Okay, could you tell me a little bit about what it was like growing up in your community? Um, so... Being a first-generation American it is very much different, I can imagine, as to what an American, like a normal average American child would grow up with, because uh, since I was the first-generation American child in my family, I learned English first as a child. So because my parents didn't really have good uh, English skills, um, at a young age, I would have to translate for them. It could be talking to the phone provider or cable or electricity company, or I could also be reading illegal documents that my parents could not read because they didn't know English that well. So I was literally bridging the gap um, for American society to my parents when I was growing up. Okay, and could you tell me about your educational experience where do you go to school? Um, so K through 12, I was in the Moore School District. So I went to um, Alfred Vale, Sussex. Then I went to Fairling Highs Middle School and I graduated from Morristown High School, class of 17. And then after high school, I did two years at community college, County College of Morris. And after my two years, I had gotten associates in information technology. And at that point, I transferred to Rutgers, New York to pursue a bachelor's in computer science. And I am currently enrolled there. Okay, great. And do you currently work anywhere? Uh, at the moment, I'm a dependent. I just help my parents with their business, like run errands and stuff like that. They like compensate me, but I'm not really like on apparel or anything. I just help my parents out from time to time. Okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, COVID-19. If you could mm -hmm. explain or describe to me, um, how did you first learn about COVID-19? Okay, so I spent a lot of time on the internet, like most people my age, and Primarily, I came across COVID-19 because I like to keep up with current events. So I saw it through Reddit and Twitter because um, I was also keeping up with um, the whole Hong Kong protest. And when the 
COVID outbreak started in Wuhan, that's when I was paying attention, I would say. Okay. And do you believe that your family also found out about COVID through online resources or through you? Could you explain that a little bit? So my parents are older. Um, we're not that old, but they're not as tech savvy as our generation. So for them, they would hear news through word of mouth from people they know or from conventional media, such as television. In my parents' case, they like to watch Telemundo and Univision. So I think they would probably have heard or been informed of COVID and what it entails through traditional news and through Facebook, through like their friends or just Facebook articles in general. And could you describe your initial reaction to the information about COVID-19? Um, I thought initially how, how devastating it seemed because it's such a, it feels like it's so unknown to, to the most elite experts that there isn't a cure. It, it was very reminiscent to me of the Ebola outbreak or swine flu from when I was in middle school. Um, but initially, I thought it would be like one of those things where it wouldn't be as bad here in the United States because of my, I don't know, I guess American ego or vanity where you just, you just think, oh, it won't be as bad here because we're America. You know, America has like all the resources to take care of it. So initially, I didn't think it would affect me personally. Do you, I'm just curious, do you feel like, do you feel the same about COVID-19 now or even our society or your generation? Do you feel like these thoughts were shared amongst everyone at first and do you think that they've changed or do you think they remain sort of similar? So speaking of where I'm at now in my life, so COVID has actually affected my family very much so. Um, practically every adult in my immediate family was affected by COVID. My mother was hospitalized. My grandmother was hospitalized. My uncle was hospitalized. Um, and then my, my mom has a lot of siblings. She's one of seven. So she was hospitalized. My aunt was hospitalized for a time. My uncle was hospitalized. My other uncle uh, had COVID-like symptoms, but he never got tested. But I would say he probably had COVID. And then also my father had COVID-like symptoms, but never got tested. Um, so I could say for, de for without a doubt that COVID, I treat COVID much more seriously now than I did during the initial baby steps of the outbreak. Um, I always try to wear a face mask when I go outside. I always try to social distance. Um, something that really bothers me was recently, um, because Governor Murphy is trying to transition us into like the phase two of um, the COVID plan, businesses are doing outdoor seating. And something that I saw on social media was that there's an unofficial Morristown Instagram account um, that will talk about and promote local businesses. And they had posted on their story a picture of, um, I guess, like a business trying to promote their uh, outdoor, I think it was called a beer garden. And on their story, you could just see that it was packed with people and none of them were wearing masks. And I, I found that that infuriated me because it seems like more and more people are breaking quarantine because they're getting bored. They think that uh, coronavirus, COVID-19 is not as serious. And I find it completely and totally absurd. It, it makes me very irate. And I, 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 I think it's because our society, American society, is more about individualism versus is collectivism so people feel that they can just not have to worry about the collective I suppose so when I was reading the comments on that picture a lot of the people in the comments actually seem to be outraged um, unlike the people who were in the picture like the it, it was quite um, quite confusing because it, 
it, like there was clear evidence that some people just have common sense and they think, you know, why are these people packed? Why are none of them wearing masks? Like, how is this even allowed to happen? So I think some people um, aren't as conscious as others. And it also shows uh, within other states, like, like, for instance, Florida had like the biggest one day spike, right? They had, because um, because their governor was like re relaxing um, their COVID quarantine. And they, like, they had like the biggest one day spike. And I think the same thing with Texas and some other states, but I don't really know them off the top of my head. Okay, and then going back again to your family members um, and having them having contracted COVID-19, um, before all this, did you or your family members have pre-existing conditions or other health problems before the pandemic started um, that may have caused worries beforehand? So in my immediate family, um, nobody has any pre-existing health condition that would make them especially susceptible to COVID-19, but extended family onwards. Uh, for instance, my grandmother, um, she's had pneumonia before and she's older, she's in her 60s and she lives alone. So we were very concerned for her uh, because she is, you know, in the, line of people that are very vulnerable. Moreover, she's also a little overweight. So because COVID affects people who are overweight and people have lung issues, um, she was very much a, a, a target for COVID, you know. Um, and so when we were in the initial days where she was feeling unwell, sick, um, it was kind of a battle to, to get her to the hospital, actually, because in my personal life, my aunt had recently died in February of breast cancer. So during her entire time of battling can cancer, uh, my grandmother has started to distrust hospitals. So when she was sick with COVID, I um, had to convince her to actually go to the hospital because uh, she's, she's, because my, my aunt died in a hospital, she's afraid of hospitals and doesn't trust them. So I had to convince her that the hospital isn't going to, you know, harm her, that they're there to treat people who are ill and that she would have a better odds of survival, you know, going to the hospital to receive some sort of treatment than just sitting home and toughing it out. So when we took her there, it was just a, a, a process of getting her to trust the medical professionals and to make her feel comfortable there. So what I would do is I would always call the nurses and check up on her like throughout the day, every few hours to see how she was doing. Um, and then there got to the point where since her oxygen levels were getting low, um, I they, they, they had requested to put her in the ICU to put her on a ventilator. And because my mother doesn't speak English well, I'm the best English speaker who is an adult, like a legal adult. I was the one who was made responsible for her, like legally speaking. I had to sign like forms on her behalf to give them permission to intubate her and for them to also administer the emergency um, like drugs that they give to COVID patients like remdesivir, for instance. I felt at that time, there was like a lot of pressure on my shoulders because I felt responsible in a sense for the well-being of my mother, even though, or not my mother, my grandmother, um, because, you know, I was her legal representative and I was signing all these documents and I just felt, you know, you know, like a chip on my shoulder, I would say. And then when my mother also got COVID, uh, I had to take care of the family business by myself because um, my father, he was taking care of his business and couldn't really help me with my mother's. So the most he could really do is offer me guidance in terms of like paying employees or like just background things that he wouldn't be able to physically help me with. Um, so in the time where my mother was sick and my grandmother was sick, I felt, uh, you know, the uh, stress kind of mount up a little bit because I felt responsible for, you know, my mother's business. Um, also her health, um, like talking to uh, nurses and doctors and as well as for my grandmother. So I feel like I feel like I had a lot on my plate in the time that they were both hospitalized. 
And I'm sort of curious about um, your living situation, like which family members you do live with and how seeing your grandmother and your mother contract COVID-19, how did that change your family dynamic during that time? So my, in my immediate family, it's my mom and dad, uh, and I have two siblings. So me, my brother, my sister, they're, my sister's 16, my brother's 15, and I'm 20. So when my mom was in the hospital for COVID, um, in my immediate household, it was just my siblings and I and my father. But my father's business is in Elizabeth, so he would have to spend most of his time at his business. And because I'm older, he doesn't really need to hover around between his business and us because I can handle it for the most part. Um, but for my grandmother, she is independent and has been living in her own studio apartment for quite some time. So to care for her was uh, before we had sent her to the emergency room, uh, my mother had a family friend take care of her and then she would just relay information to us to see, or just to give us like updates of how my grandmother was doing up until when we had to take her to the hospital. Uh, did your family have access to healthcare for their symptoms? Um, what do you mean, like in terms of going to the hospital? Yeah, or even being able to go get tested or um, was there any type of conflict where like one of them maybe didn't have healthcare, they, there was a problem or like they were scared to go to the hospital because of that, um, any, anything like that? Yeah, so my grandmother, I don't think she has insurance um, because when she went to the hospital and uh, I was in contact with the nurses and the people who get you like settled into the hospital. Um, I had received a call from like the, I guess, billing department or the people who ask you if, you know, if you have insurance. So when they were asking me questions about my grandmother's insurance, I really, uh, the best of my ability, I, I guess she was on charity care, but that's, that's not really um, like something that people should really rely on for medical treatment. Um, so I would say my grandmother was afraid of being unable to pay for her, her treatment, um, as well as my mother. She also was uh, afraid of being unable to pay for treatment. But I think they were using charity care for their care that they received. But another concern my grandmother had um, was, I, I would say it's like partially irrational, but also I can understand where she's coming from is my grandmother's not documented, so um, getting ICE involved or somehow, because I, I can understand that fear because for undocumented people, ICE seems like, I don't know, like some sort of secret police that come and tears families apart when you least expect it. So she was afraid that, I don't know, for whatever reason, ICE would be involved. But fortunately, that was not a, a, a reality for us. Um, I was wondering how you and your family members isolated during that time or how you managed uh, during that illness, especially since it did touch your home itself. So self-quarantining was difficult in my household um, for my parents because my mother would really just not follow protocol before she got sick during the initial days of COVID-19 outbreak. For instance, my mother would visit people um, or forget to wear a mask. And I would lecture her and tell her that she should take this more seriously. And lo and behold, she contacted it. But I don't really blame her though, because you can get COVID from money, touching a doorknob. Like you could take the most precaution. You can literally stay home and still get COVID because there has been cases of people 
following quarantine and getting COVID. So another thing that I struggled with with my parents was um, just like keeping them away from people because they're both uh, small business owners. They can't really manage that that well um, because they have to, for instance, like run errands for the business. Um, so in their place, I offered myself to go in, in their stead, but it's also difficult because I'm putting myself at risk and my family at risk because you know I'm going out in public and you don't know who's coughing on what, who's not using hand sanitizer. So for me, I, I often have this, often had this struggle of, um, am I following quarantine or I'm kind of like breaking quarantine because I have to go out and do these errands for the businesses because there's really no alternative because you can't not get these things done because then that would just impact the business. The business would be unable to function, right? If I don't get groceries done, there's no food to serve at the restaurant or at the deli. So that was something I, I uh, thought about often. Um, but in terms of like sanitizing, we would you know wipe down commonly touched surfaces to the best of our ability. Um, and going back to when your mom and your grandmother were in the hospital, how long were they in the hospital for? Uh, what was that like for you in terms of communication or um, yeah, being just being able to stay in contact with them um, or just knowing, getting updates on how they're doing, things like that. Uh -huh. So when we initially took my grandmother, she had breathing problems and she is a very stubborn old lady and kept on insisting on that she would be fine if she used like a, like one of those vaporizers, if you have like a, a stuffy nose, right? She thought that she would, she could uh, somehow endure with just that. Uh, and because of her distrust of hospitals, because of what happened to my aunt, she was being very obstinate and did not want, want to go. But because she respects me and sees that me and my mother at the time had only the best intentions for we we want her to be well we were able to convince her to go to the hospital and then when they took her to the hospital they checked her oxygen levels and they saw that they were very low so they had to take her to the icu and they put her in a lot of oxygen i don't really remember i'd say it was between like six and eight liters of oxygen because her oxygen levels were quite low um so once she was, you know, uh, in the ICU, obviously they weren't able to take visitors to the hospital. So that was very difficult for my grandmother. She was in a, you know, a hospital by herself. I could tell that she seemed scared, anxious. And it was very heartbreaking for my mom because she was so afraid that her mother could very well die from COVID because it does affect elderly people more seriously. So... I always tried to the best of my ability to keep in contact with the hospital to see how she was doing, to get updates so I could calm down my mother and give her peace of mind, and as well as let them know that my grandmother um, has people that care about her. And maybe I thought that if they were able to see that she had people that cared for her, maybe they would have been and sensitized to care for her better. That was like one of my thoughts that I had in the back of my head. So then in the time that my mother got sick, um, it was very, it was very routine for me personally because my mother has um, pre-existing health issues in terms of uh, high blood pressure. So every, every so often, if my mother is very stressed, um, her blood pressure can rise where we would have to take her to the emergency room. So um, seeing her unwell, I was able to react as if I was following just like a procedure in my mind because it's something that I'm accustomed to. But in terms of COVID-19, I tried to, um, like for instance, you know how like, um, like the CDC, they wear hazmat suits I don't have a hazmat suit, so I put on a windbreaker. 
with a long funnel neck. I wore my mask and gloves and sweatpants and like tried to cover my sleeves and open skin as much as I could to protect myself. Um, and then I drove her to the hospital. And same thing with my other because uh, her English isn't as good. I had to uh, be the bridge. So the bridge between her and the healthcare providers to you know, facilitate communication. And she also was a little scared to go to the hospital too, because it's just, um, she was just very nervous of the possibility of having COVID. And when she did have COVID, it made her anxious. And she's also complaining about pain um, when she was in the hospital. So I remember that she would call me sometimes in the middle of the night um, and complain about pain and say that, she thinks she wasn't being treated well by the healthcare providers because she was complaining about pain in her sides. So th I thought that was a little concerning because in the back of my mind, I thought, you know, if somebody's complaining about pain, you know, maybe they should do something about it, right? To like have good a nurse just be there and just like not like ignore somebody, right? If they're in pain. So I had called uh, after my mother had called me that night and I explained to them like what she was feeling. And I asked them what kind of medication they were giving her for her pain. And they said they were giving her like uh, this one medication. I don't remember right off the top of my head. It starts with a T and that they had recently given it to her. But my, when my mother called me, she seemed like she was in excruciating pain, honestly. And it was uh, concerning, but there was nothing I could do because when I was having a conversation with a the nurse, they said, uh, even though it seems like she's in pain, um, they can't administer anything else. It would have to be the doctor's orders. So the doctor would have to see her and prescribe something else. But that wouldn't have been until like the next day at like nine o'clock. So I think what they had given her was like something for anxiety, but I could tell my mother was still in discomfort. And the next day had passed and I was, doing my routine and I had called and checked up to see if my mom was seen by the doctor and she wasn't. And this had gone on for maybe like two and a half days where she has, has, has not been seen by a doctor to be prescribed a different medication. And in the back of my mind, I was thinking like, I'm sure they're busy um, because they're, they are overwhelmed with COVID patients. Um, so, so I was giving them the benefit of the doubt for a time, um, but my mom would still complain about pain. Um, and the, and then, so it took my grandmother, I think over 21 days to get out of the hospital. And my mother, she was in the ICU, like somewhere in the middle of my grandmother's duration at the ICU. And they both got out at the same day. Uh, my grandmother was making progress, but because of um, being on the ventilator, she had like temporary dementia where she thought that the healthcare providers were out to get her. Um, I remember this one instance, she was saying that a nurse was like a, a full like Caucasian, like somebody who does not speak Spanish nurse said to her in Spanish, <laughs> Oh, otra que ya se va, which would translate to, oh, somebody's on their way out or somebody who's like going to leave, implying that my grandmother is like going to die of COVID. Um, so my grandmother would, would act very paranoid whenever the healthcare providers were in the room with her. So I tried my best to um, ease her nerves and try to calm her down and convince her that nobody was out there to get her. She also had another... Um, instance of like paranoia where she thought there was like men in black suits like that were going to kidnap her with like a sack like they were going to put her in a sack and like kidnap her um so i thought that was uh maybe her internalized fear of um hospitals just like manifesting in her paranoia that that's what i thought um but yeah, so when she was uh, released or discharged from the hospital with my mother, um, the family friend who was caring for her initially um, was caring for her again because she was a little weak when she came out of the hospital, so she wasn't able to be independent on upon discharge. And then when my father and I went to go pick up my mother, 
um, they had given her a prescription and we took her home. My dad took her home. I went to the pharmacy to get a prescription. And it seemed like she was still in discomfort, even though they had uh, prescribed her some drugs for the pain. And um, it turned out that when she was at the hospital, she the pain that she was feeling was kidney stones, which was kind of relieving for us because we thought, like, what if it was something really serious? Because we hadn't known for so long. But it turned out to be kidney stones, right? Um, so... Uh, when I went to go give her her prescription and maybe like a day or two had passed and she was still feeling like a lot of uh, pain and discomfort. Um, so we thought that the medication that they were giving her from Morrison Memorial Hospital was not sufficient. So my father and I decided that we wanted a second opinion to see if there was like maybe something else they could give her. So we took her to a different hospital and we took her to Summit Overlook Hospital and there they were able to um, give her like a better medication for her pain but I don't think that really um, could answer your question because that's not related to COVID that's her kidney stones but anyway I thought it was uh, something worthwhile to share. Yeah of course. Um, I did want to touch a little bit on uh, the way that maybe your community or your family and friends are reacting during this time I was wondering if there were any organizations or agencies um, within your community that provided resources during the pandemic, like your church or your school, um, local government, or maybe even like the hospital themselves, um, what they might have been doing in regard to uh, trying to help you or your community out. Yeah, so, uh... Personally, I was fortunate enough to encounter some resources um, in terms of like counseling my mental health from the hospital because I was dealing with um, two family members who were with COVID. And that's kind of a lot for like one person to really deal with on their own. So the uh, hospital had offered me um, like a counseling service, like a grief counseling service for people whose family members are afflicted by COVID. I had turned them down for it though, because I felt like I didn't really necessarily need it. Um, Cause I do have a good support network in terms of friends and a loving girlfriend. So I didn't think I really needed that resource in terms of community. Um, so in the area where the deli, my mom's deli is, there's a church across the street and a church at the block behind us. Um, they both um, were offering free, free, lunches, free hot meals for people. Um, just the other day, uh, uh, the church behind the deli was giving away like free groceries to people. They had like this big like eight-wheeler truck came in and they had like a long line of people waiting for like groceries. So they were like giving away um, fresh produce, like milk, stuff like that. And then yesterday I actually saw that there was um, like a mobile truck for Zoofall Clinic. And I guess they were, I'm not really sure what they were doing, but I'm, they were like offering like services to people who needed it in the area. Yeah. So I, I could say that I have seen some um, organiz, you know, organizations and services to people who needed them because they were afflicted by COVID in my area. That's great. Um, I also wanted to talk about uh, your mom's business and even your dad's business. Um, mm -hmm. I know that they both own their individual small businesses. Uh, you mentioned that your dad was working all the time um, and your mom, you had to sort of take over that a little bit. Uh, could you tell me how long they've owned these businesses for um, and how those businesses may have been directly impacted by COVID? Yeah. So my parents, first had a business on, uh, it was their first restaurant together. They started that when I was in middle school, but then they, uh, a lease was expired and they weren't gonna renew the lease. So then they decided to get a lease at the deli initially. And then they had the deli for maybe a year or two when my parents decided they wanted to open a new business. And then they opened up my dad's restaurant in Elizabeth. So the current businesses they have now are the deli and the restaurant Elizabeth, and they manage them separately. So 
I would say they've been almost within our family for like almost a decade at this point. Um, what was the other question that you asked? I was wondering how they were impacted directly by COVID. You can talk about uh -huh. health precautions or anything of the sort. Okay. So my father's business this was way worse than my mother's business because his is a restaurant and restaurants, you know, are sit down, eat places. And because of quarantine, uh, restaurants aren't allowed to have people inside. So business had slowed down considerably for my dad. Um, I remember before quarantine, weekends would be so busy at his place. Um, we'd have like four waitresses and families would come in, in and out of the door. The restaurant would be like, like so, so packed with people having, you know, family times, just laughter. Like he, it was, it, my dad's place is like a family restaurant. So you could just see like families having a good time. And because of COVID, because of quarantine, um, business had slowed down for my dad. And it's just very sad to see his restaurant empty, you know, cause it, it was, it used to be so, so, uh, so busy. Um, but because of COVID, he had to cut back on um, like the amount of employees working there and just like adjusting to this new COVID world. Uh, in terms of my mother, her business wasn't as affected as drastically because her deli is mostly takeout food. So um, she, of course she had to stack up and like get rid of the furniture so people don't, so people can't sit there. Um, she in terms of like client base though like people's people are very loyal to my mother's business and they always go and pick up food um in terms of safety precautions both the restaurant and the deli uh put up like barriers between the uh waitresses and like so so they also have a buffet where uh people can it's like a it's like enclosed by glass so there's no risk of people like contaminating the food but what they did is they like put up plastic barriers that were like pretty tall so there's like absolutely no risk of contaminating like the people who work behind it and like the food. So that that's in place at both businesses. Um, at my mother's deli, uh, I had also made signs that uh, in English and in Spanish for, um, to tell clients that to wear masks, to wash their hands, like things like that. And then the other day, um, more so Memorial Hospital, I guess, was coming by to local businesses and giving them like more official looking um, like flyers and stuff that they can hang out to spread awareness of like COVID and like safety precautions. So that's like all over in my mom's, my mom's restaurant. And could you tell me a little bit about your role within the business uh, once mm -hmm. the pandemic hit and once your mom did get sick, how that may have changed from before COVID-19? So before COVID-19, the way I would make my pocket change is by helping out my parents' businesses on the weekends. So for instance, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I would go help out my dad's restaurant and bus dishes, wash dishes, buy the groceries. But most importantly, like uh, bus the dishes because at my father's place, it would get very busy um, because people bring their entire family there. So it will be like parties of like, you know, up to like 10 people. So, um, and, and since the space is, you know, pretty, pretty, a pretty good size, um, dishes pile up. So I would be there busing dishes like, uh, for a while. Um, or when I'm not working at my dad's place on the weekends throughout the week, when I'm out of class, I help out my mom's, uh, deli. So I'll just get groceries for her. I'll, um, just like run some errands. Like if they need like maybe onions or something, like I would run to the store and get it. Um, but my dad's business had a larger workload than my mom's. So I would help him a lot. Uh, but moving towards like a, a COVID world, uh, business had slowed down a lot for my dad. So he couldn't really obviously afford to be paying all the employees that he had there. So um, he would have to cut down on the amount of employees he had working like waitresses and kitchen staff. Um, and he couldn't, he didn't really need me to bust dishes anymore, obviously, because people aren't sitting down and eating there because uh, they're, they can only uh, order out. But for my mom's place, uh, 
since she was hospitalized, I had to uh, pick up a lot of uh, the responsibilities that she left because she was hospitalized. So I had like pay the rent, pay the employees, um, do all the grocery shopping, and also like do like household things. I pretty much became the head of my household for like a short period of time because uh, my dad obviously uh, like i said he is spending all day at the restaurant which is not a close drive to home so it would be like just inefficient for him to be going back and forth so often so i was the head of the house uh, my siblings are teenagers so i wasn't really concerned with um needing to babysit them because they're 15 and 16. um the most I really needed them to do was just like do some like home things like keep the house clean, walk the dogs, help me cook meals. Um, and, uh, something that my mom really appreciated was that um, I'd always, I would always cook my siblings breakfast. I would, uh, whenever I got up, I would make myself coffee and then I would make them pancakes with uh, bacon stuff. My mom thought that was uh, very cute. Um, but I thought, that it was just me being like a thoughtful big brother because, you know, it's like a stressful time to see so many, so many of your family members be affected by COVID. So I thought like little thoughtful things here and there that I could do for my siblings would help their morale. So that's why I did that. And could we talk just a little bit about um, how COVID may have impacted both your business and your family finance? your parents' businesses and your family financially. Um, do you believe that that change in um, the amount of, uh, uh, unemplo- well, even like how many employees you could have, um, how many people were stopping by, um, did you see an enormous impact or no? Um, so like I had mentioned earlier, my father's business had slowed down considerably because of COVID. He was unable to keep as many of his uh, employees um, scheduled because it was just not feasible because there's less people spending money there. So he can't afford to have, um, you know, people on the clock, which is uh, disappointing and sad because that also affects them because they also have families that... They, they need to put food on the table. So my father did to the best of his ability and still is trying to um, fairly distribute um, like uh, hours between his employees. But going back to my mother's business, the first few weeks of COVID, um, there was a noticeable drop in business because people are quarantining, they're afraid to leave the house. But now um, like, three months later into quarantine, people are feeling more emboldened to go outside. Um, Quarantine has become more lax these days. Um, So business has been getting actually, business for my mom has been picking up and it's been decent. Like I remember just the other day, there was like, um, like a queue for people trying to get inside the business because my mom tries to socially distance at her place. So people try to, since like there's no furniture, people can spread out and like make a line and like uh, order takeout food. So like her business is, is I would say um, not business as usual, but it's close to there, fortunately. Has your mother gone back to work already? So my mother doesn't necessarily work there. Uh, she has kitchen staff, like she, doesn't have to do cooking there unless it's really necessary because there's been times where, you know, some employees get sick or they're unable to come in. So my mom will work that shift and like be in the kitchen or be in the front, um, like serving people food. So, but recently during the outbreak and quarantine, no, she hasn't really been working there just to eliminate the amount of people in the space. And now I did want to talk about how this impacted you specifically. I know that you are in college right now. Um, Mm -hmm. How did, I mean, this was 
within the last couple of months and weeks. How did um, all of this impact your semester, your education, um, things of that sort? Okay, so during the semester, there was news of the Wuhan outbreak, and as I was like trying to keep up with events, um, I really had no expectations that you know America and me personally would have been impacted so greatly by COVID. But as you know, it progressed because our society is like a, a global interconnected society. You know, somebody from in China, you know, brought it could have brought it home and they have, you know, could Italy, like bas basically because we're so inter interconnected, it spread rapidly. Um, so I remember missing, so I think I think the week where we stopped going to school was spring break for Rutgers Newark. And then because it was getting worse and worse in the United States, those were like the first few weeks of like the American COVID-19 outbreak. Um, we were unsure if we would go back to school and then we didn't go back to school. So then, pretty much every college in the United States and every school and every job transitioned to an online model. And at first I adjusted fine to it because I had taken online classes previously at community college. So it wasn't like I was out of my element per se, but some classes definitely do feel different um, online versus uh, in person. So. For example, uh, my cloud computing uh, class and my data structure class for my computer science major, those are classes that benefit greatly from face-to-face -face interaction because these are more um, theory concepts and it's just better to have a human right in front of you so you can ask questions or you can ask them to slow down or whatever. Being on technology, over Zoom or whatever medium we used for that specific professor, because also all the professors were not on the same page on if they wanted to use Zoom or whatever the school had provided. That was a little tedious, but obviously I had to do what I had to do to not fail my classes. Um, but I remember just thinking how much I missed actually being in the classroom. Um, a pro of not, you know, having to go to school is the commute. I had, I had saved so much money on gas. Probably that's probably the only good thing I would say. Um, Rutgers also had refunded people for their parking, so I was glad for that. I was getting a little bit of money back. Um, I think Rutgers personally handled the pandemic pretty well. Um, they also offered to give students uh, money if they had a need. So I had. Um, they, 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 um, it was like on a first, first come first serve basis. So I had applied for that. Um, and I did receive some, a little bit of money from Rutgers, which I greatly appreciated as well did, um, as well as other, other classmates of mine that received money from Rutgers. Um, so I could say that my school handled it pretty well. Another thing that I didn't like from, uh, online school though is this is just like a gripe that I had to personally experience was some professors weren't as considerate for uh, people's internet at home because unfortunately internet isn't like a utility in this country. So some people can be like internet insecure and not have a good stable connection at home or they can have issues with their Wi-Fi, which would impact their learning. So I would say that in my home life that my needs are met that we get by, like I'm not poor, I don't have any wants, but I have bad Wi-Fi personally. So there's been instances where I would just like drop connection in classes and not been able to reconnect because my Wi-Fi is just not working that day. I only had like one professor that really had an issue like that, but for the most part, most of my professors were very accommodating to the whole situation because this is, this is unprecedented. Um, so yeah, um, another thing is losing motivation um, to participate in online school. Because um, you're not leaving the house, you know, 
you just sit down in a quiet space and just connect from your desktop or laptop, um, that can really impact people's routine. I felt my routine had been shaken up because typically, you know, I would get up early, go to school, um, work on stuff between classes, um, get lunch, go to the gym, drive home. I couldn't do that because the gym is closed, school is closed, can't go anywhere. So what I try to do to um, keep my motivation up is, for instance, I would still get up early, shower, I would make myself coffee like I, I was would, and I would get dressed. I would get dressed to participate in my online class because it felt like um, if I was in my home clothes, like pajamas and stuff, I just felt um, I wasn't motivated to work. So being dressed kind of, I guess, helped my mentality to be more focused. But it's still difficult, though, the lack of um, face-to-face -face interaction with like peers and your professor. Because I remember there's definitely been times where I would just be so bored. And because it's like Zoom and uh, there's like many people in a Zoom call, like I could just like, in theory, just like, like, you know, phone it in and like do something else while I'm in class, which I have done once or twice, I have to admit. Um, but the whole online school is definitely something that um, it was an adjustment a little bit. Like just a little bit because I I've had done it before, but just given the circumstances, it was it was an adjustment. Um, aside from school, um, COVID had affected me uh, mentally, like stress wise, because I had a lot on my plate. In the time that my grandmother was in the hospital and my mother was in the hospital, I like I had said previously, I was like pretty much the head of my house. I was um, in charge of communicating. Um, information about my mom and grandmother to the rest of my family because they don't speak English. Um, I had to call every so often to check up on them, see how they were doing, sign documents. I had felt like a real adult because being a college student, you feel you feel like trapped in between uh, somewhere being like being adult level of freedom, but also being a teenager in terms of you know like as well right like you have the freedom of a teenager and an adult because you can not have money like a teenager but have all the responsibility of an adult you know it's it's like weird and especially in my case because i'm still a dependent um i'm just like in that weird adult teenage limbo did you tell me about um any other daily impacts that uh covid might have had whether it's um friendships, relationships, um, just how, how it changed, like, like you said, like, your teenage life to an adult life, um, if you could go a little bit into detail with that. Yeah, so, because of quarantine, it's very difficult for people to adjust, because as humans, we're very social, and we want to see our friends, we want to see our family members, um, so I remember when I had um, dropped off my grandmother and my mother, I was self-quarantining myself as best as I could because I still had to go out and do like all these errands for my mom's business because if, if I wasn't able to do it, then you know, the business would suffer. But in terms of like quarantining, I didn't see any of my friends and I didn't see my girlfriend for like two weeks, um, which is like kind of hard because uh, you want to spend time with the people that you love. Um, I did try the best of my ability to like facilitate like that human interaction via Zoom. So I would like call my girlfriend on Zoom and we would watch, we would watch things together on Netflix because <laughs> that's what we do um, when we're together. So it would be like a, some way to like get some normalcy, right? Um, I also had arranged or was involved in like a group of uh, zoom with my friends uh because we like to keep in touch and it was like really nice to see my friends uh, because you know during quarantine can't see your friends and you know we we talk over like in a group chat but it's like not the same thing as like you know hearing their voices seeing their faces on zoom that felt really good um i remember i had also uh, taken part in like a surprise birthday zoom call for my friend, which is odd. I don't really I never thought I would have to do that, you know 
because typically you could just go to your friend's house. But yeah, I was in a surprise birthday party Zoom call for a friend. Um, but after my mom was discharged and the two weeks are up, um, I tried my best to like socially distance, obviously, but businesses started opening up. So um, me and my girlfriend went on a date actually for once. We went really early though, uh, at, in this place in Madison. It was like, it's a very cute coffee shop. We went very early to minimize the amount of people we would see there. And we had the place to ourselves. So it was like very nice to have like just a moment of normalcy in the midst of such a turbulent time, you know? Um, do you believe that this pandemic has affected your age group in a different manner? And if you do think that helps so? Yeah, I think so. I think my generation, our generation is in such a weird time because we grew, we've grown up seeing so many like, awful things. Like our earliest memories are 9-11, um, like, and other terrible things like terrorist attacks, mass shootings. So I feel like our generation has developed like a coping mechanism in terms of like um, humor, like dark humor. Because uh, during this time or during many sad times, I would just go on Twitter, right? Just to see something funny, right? And a lot of people just cope with dark humor on Twitter. I remember when, uh, like I would crack COVID jokes to my friends um, in the time that my family members were in the hospital because it, that was my way of coping, right? Just like through dark humor. Um, but also it seems like our generation is just, since because we're like more more tech savvy that we can adjust a little bit better than our older counterparts like our parents or like teachers or whatever so if you ever go on social media like you'll always see like people not knowing like how to use a mask or like using a mask really wrong like remember for instance there's this one viral video of this older woman who cut a slit in her mask because she couldn't breathe while on her mask um like obviously our our peers wouldn't do that because that defeats the purpose of the mask. Um, but moreover, I think our peers also, um, because of like this whole situation that we live in, like our peers are just like, maybe we're a little, maybe feeling a little sad, a little scared because nobody knows what's really gonna happen with college. Like a lot of people also have lost internships, job opportunities because of COVID. Um, like, go, like this fall semester is, kind of scary because nobody really knows what's going to happen for their situation or schools. So it's like a, it's like a mixed bag. I, I think it's like people trying to cope to the best of their ability, given just our, you know, our contemporary, it's, um, yeah. As a college student, did you lose any um, internships or anything this summer or even in the upcoming fall? Um, no, I didn't miss any uh, internships because I didn't apply for any, which I should have, but that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> um, but I have had friends who have missed out on, on opportunities because of COVID. For instance, I had my one friend who was studying abroad in Spain, and because Europe was, you know, a hot zone for COVID-19, um, she had to end her study abroad program early and had to be self-quarantined. Um, she was like one of the first people who had a self-quarantine in my friend group because she was abroad, which she was at risk for being in contact with uh, COVID. Um, but me personally, I didn't miss out on like, internship or job opportunities. Um, but I know people who have, so. And I did want to discuss, um, you know, the civil unrest that has been going on um, due to police brutality, George Floyd, um, Black Lives Matter protests and rallies. Um, I know that you've told me before that you have participated in mm -hmm. um, a protest or uh, something similar. Could you describe um, how this movement has affected your life in conjunction with COVID-19 and 
sort of how you were feeling in terms of taking that step and being like, I am like, I am going to go participate um, in the midst of a pandemic. Okay. That's a good question. Uh, I can go into a whole horror for that. Um, so to start, I am conscious politically. Um, I would say I'm liberal. Um, so early in my, my childhood, early middle school age, I think like one of the first um, eye-opening events to police brutality was Trayvon, because I think when the whole Trayvon Martin scenario happened, we were in middle school. And then as we aged, we saw, you know, other instances like um, another notable one was Eric Garner and um, Freddie Gray. Um, those are just some of the few that I remember off the top of my head, but I remember, you know, being an adolescent and just seeing so many instances of police brutality. Um, so personally, that has made me have resentment towards uh, like authority of like the police. And also because I'm uh, Hispanic, I faced uh, discrimination for being Hispanic. Um, like a common thing that many uh, people who are like children of immigrants face is discrimination for speaking another language that's not English. Um, like there are ignorant people who will tell you, oh, this is America, like speak English, even though America has no official language. And in my case, you know, I was speaking Spanish and America is like the second largest Spanish speaking country. Um, I just found those people to be ignorant and bigoted. Um, another thing that moved me to become more um, politically involved is um, immigration. I have, I have friends, I have family members that are undocumented, family members that are, that are on DACA, friends that are on DACA, and seeing instances of ICE raids, the way ICE treats people, the way this government treats um, the ICE detention centers, it's infuriating to say the least. It, it very much makes my blood boil to see um, people who look like me be dehumanized actively um, because the way like they incarcerate children in these ICE detention centers, the way people are treated and dehumanized um, it has made me very um, active, uh, politically speaking, to go to protest because there's also been instances of police brutality on Latinx people. Uh, there was this one, I think, in the past two years where this one, I'm not sure if he was documented or not, but this one Hispanic man was shot dead by the police and this altercation that was just another instance of police brutality. Um, so me going out to protest George Floyd um, is an act of wanting to add like one voice to the sea of voices that want to see change, you know? Um, because historically speaking, people who look like me, people who are not white, have been abused by this country. So being outspoken, going to protest, because it's my constitutional right, I will you know, act on that to try to make a change. I want to be, you know, I want to be one of those people that can say to the next generation and, you know, those that come after that, yeah, I was in the streets, I was protesting because I wanted to make a difference, you know? So those are things that motivate me to, to go protest. That's great. Um, and then I just have a few final questions. Um, I am curious if, um, uh, you have any family back home in Honduras or, you know, back home for your family, for your parents, um, and how they might've been coping with COVID-19 if you do have any family back there. So, yeah, so I do have family on both sides of my parents from Honduras and they would, I would try to keep them in the loop when my mom and my grandma were in the hospital because I was, um, in charge of like, um, 
communicating and relaying all this information to my extended family. So I would like leave messages to family members on WhatsApp and giving them updates to see how, to let them know how my family was emerged, you know, my family members in, in America at that, you know, at COVID. Um, for instance, um, my dad's aunt would call me very often because she is very fond of my, my mom. So I would have a lot of uh, conversations with my aunt and let her know, letting her know that, you know, what was up and things like that. So yeah, we have, we have, like my whole extended family was concerned for us and um, involved. Okay. And if you have anything else that you would like to share with me about your experiences with COVID-19 that I haven't asked about, um, please feel free to do so right now. Um, when, yeah. Um, yeah, so when he initially approached me about the nature of this interview, um, something that I really um, thought about also myself was like the impact of COVID-19 to Hispanic people and Latinx people, like this community. I see a lot of uh, Latinx people that come and go from my mom's deli. I'm so sorry, Jason. It your the internet like cut off for like a second. If you yeah, could start I'm sorry. over with what you said. No, it's okay. Um, I just missed everything you said. But um, if you don't mind repeating that, please do so. Okay. So um, to get back to when you first uh, uh, were first talking about the nature of this interview, I had also had thoughts about how. COVID-19 was going to impact the Latinx community because this community as well as the Black community is disproportionately affected by COVID-19 because, you know, statistically speaking, we're poor and have less access um, to care as opposed to our white counterparts. So I think something that I was really concerned about is um, like how devastating this could be to like my immediate to my immediate community because there is a lot of um, Hispanic people in my town, and you know they're they're at risk for for this uh, for this virus, and as well as just like general information of how to act during quarantine because I definitely see like um, Hispanic people uh, walking around without masks on, and I think to myself, is that just um, is that like a language barrier? Like, do they not know? Or is that like information that's not getting relayed to them? And just like things of that nature, I, I, I often wonder. And just, I thought if I participated in this interview that maybe me by telling my story or whatever happened to me could somehow benefit my community as a whole, you know? So that's why I thought uh, this would have been a good idea for me to take part of. Yeah, I would definitely like to thank you so much for participating and helping me out. Um, mm -hmm. I am going to stop recording. <laughs>